1059 The Region, in partnership with REMAX Prime Properties, present On the Market, real estate advice that works for you. Have a real estate question? Call us at 416-335-1059. Tweet us at 1059 The Region or email us at info at 1059theregion.com. This is 105.9 The Region. I'm Tina Cortez with On The Market, York Region's exclusive radio real estate show. My co-host and our real estate expert is Asif Khan with REMAX Prime Properties. Good morning, Asif. Good morning, Tina. And we're going to start the show today with the Ontario Real Estate Association CEO, Tim Hudak. Tim, welcome back to On The Market. Hey, thanks, Asa. It's great to be back on the market. And man, there's a lot of things on the market these days when it comes to, anyway, politics in real estate that will impact buyers and sellers. So really good timing. and Thanks for having me back. Yeah, and, and plenty to talk about is uh, an understatement almost with the federal budget in early April. We've got, uh, you know, we're heading into the provincial election, Tim. There's also the interest rate hikes and likely more to come. What's Aurea's take on the current state of the real estate market? Well, look, we um, are going to continue to see strong um, buyer uh, demand, I think, whether you're in a big city or a small town, because people know, number one, that real estate is a smart long-term investment. Um, second, <laughs> you can't live inside a stock or a bond, and people want to pursue that Canadian dream of having a place to call their their own and to raise their kids. And we have more people in the millennial generation, as well as uh, new Canadians or rivals from across Canada, looking to have those keys to a great place to call home here in the province of Ontario. Um, when I talk to agents and ask if you've got a great perspective, obviously, on this, it does seem like there's a, a tempering in the market. We're not seeing the same insane level of activity that we may have in the past. Um, mm-hmm. But I do believe that we're going to still see a lot of people who want to get in the marketplace because they believe in home ownership and good for them. And Tim, the other real estate story that's really making headlines is the idea of blind bidding, allowing home buyers to see all bids on real estate sales. What's the good and bad on this idea? And I know you were involved in this. Yeah, for sure. And I know there's a lot of frustrated buyers, uh, you know, out there who go to one home and they dream about, well, you know, where the crib's going to go and what the backyard's going to be like, and they make their offer and they don't get the home. And then they go to the next place. And my wife, Debbie, and I have been through that ourselves on many occasions, and it is painful. And the best thing we can do, Tina, to help people in that situation is just make sure that more homes available. Like, government should be focusing its energy on helping create more homes that average hardworking Canadians can afford. So starter homes, move up homes when the kids come along, you need more space, uh, and quality rentals. That should be job number one. Uh, I know as a result of not enough supply in the marketplace, we were focusing uh, Mm -hmm. on the offer process. Uh, Aria did make suggestions to the province to offer a, a new alternative when it comes to selling your home. So we like the announcements we saw this past week, but we would still love to see more attention paid to getting more affordable housing inventory in the marketplace. And, and Tim, I know that uh, we are, you know, we're, we're kind of bound by our ethics and our, our codes of conduct on what we can disclose to other members of the public when it comes to multiple offers and, and bidding wars. Are there going to be changes in TRESA to allow realtors to disclose information, pertinent information about an offer to other parties? Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. And that's what we saw from uh, the province of Ontario uh, this week. You described it really well. A lot of people don't know this, but it's the government of Ontario that says that you need to keep the contents of an offer on a housing purchase confidential. And and they do so for good reason. Probably next to health information, our personal financial information is very precious, very private. You know, how much you can afford for the home, how much your deposit is. You have to sell your own home. That's all very personal information. And that's why realtors right now are not allowed to disclose that, to protect confidentiality by government order. So we said, okay, we we get that. But, you know, could we offer uh, another option in the marketplace? And that would be that, uh, realtors could share the contents of all of the offers taking place when there's a multiple offer scenario on a home, but it should be done with consent that both buyers and sellers should willingly go into that process to say that they're willing to share that information, but you shouldn't force them into it. We, we really feel this notion of, of banning other ways to sell your home and mandating auctions where no matter what you say or what you do, all your personal information is out there for display. That would be wrong-headed. We think it would reduce inventory in the marketplace 
because of the uncertainty. And we also think that mandatory auctions would drive up prices even further. And Tim, do you think that the seller or other parties will consent to this? I, I do. Let, let me tell you why. We already see a few uh, businesses in the marketplace that uh, want to do this uh, type of option. Uh, it is very common in Australia and New Zealand where you know buyers and sellers uh, opt into this process. Um, auctions are not mandated there. They're, they're just very popular. Really, the topic is home sellers think that they will increase the value of their home. Um, others believe that there's more transparency to it. But look, I think that this will um, will give a new option that is more transparent. And ultimately, it gets a good balance between transparency, but respecting a home buyer's right to decide what they do with their home. You know, this is your biggest purchase. It's where you have your most precious family memories. And you're going to rely on that home to have a retirement with dignity or maybe to get a bigger home because the kids need more room. We do believe fundamentally that the home seller should be in the driver's seat with what happens with their home, but we've given a new option uh, that will help uh, improve the process that both buyers and sellers agree. And, and Tim, when we're looking at the models that Australia and New Zealand have, we see the appreciation that they're showing in, in terms of price appreciation on homes that are selling. It is higher than what we're seeing in Canada right now, and that's, I, I think that has to do with if you know that someone else is paying $5,000 more for the house that you really want, and now that information is available to you, you're going to pay 6000 and then they're going to pay 7000 Whereas with the blind bidding process, it was almost like you were calling their bluff and saying, you know what, I'm not, I don't think that they've gone that high. I'm going to stay here. Do you think that this will continue to drive prices up? And, and is there any hope that this will contribute to affordability? Yeah, we should be crystal clear and, and candid with what, what this means. It does put a, a more transparent option on the table for both buyers and sellers, so they can choose that, and, and they have the right to choose that. But I, I don't believe at the end of the day it's going to bring down prices. In fact, as you just described, asset, that kind of auction fever that develops, when you get emotional about that and you want to beat the other person by 1,000, it keeps getting ratcheted up. It has been demonstrated in countries that use that in Australia and New Zealand to have rapid price increases. The bottom line is the only way that we're going to bring those keys closer to home for struggling families today that desperately want to own a home is to increase choice and inventory in the marketplace. Give them a break when it comes to the land transfer tax for first-time home buyers. Those are things the government could do today. This gives them more choice, and it's part of an overall package to raise the bar and professional standards to make sure it's tougher discipline. We fully support the notion that somebody's breaking the rules to kick them out of the profession. That's all good. But the best way to actually make prices more affordable, you've got to increase supply. Other things will not do that trick. And Tim, why now? Why the updated code of ethics now? Why the opening up of the blind bidding process? Well, I think that's good work by um, by our team at Ontario Real Estate Association, the leaders like us that push for this and they meet with MPPs or talk about it uh, on on the radio and our elected realtor leaders. We, we've been pushing for this at Queen's Park uh, for some time. In fact, in 2017, we began this process because the current legislation, REBA, uh, came out in 2002, right? So that was 20 years ago, and the real estate market has changed substantially. I mean, you couldn't, for an average home in Toronto, I think it was about 235000 in those days, you couldn't buy a doghouse these days. <laughs> So the rules, the penalties that they didn't even contemplate in those days, you know, uh, the, the notion uh, of uh, so many online uh, transactions that you could do. So this is all part of an effort to say, let's get into the 2022 era and let's make sure that we have North American leading standards when it comes to options for consumers, business options for realtors, and consumer protections that will make us North American leaders. You know, we're more than doubling the fines, a greater ability for the regular to investigate suspicious behavior, suspend, revoke licenses. You know, all of that is good stuff. Maybe it was a long time in the making, but we're really happy with the progress that's been made as a result of realtors standing up for consumers and a fair, modern uh, housing market that has North American leading standards. And, and Tim, you just touched on the changing market. Some are calling what's happening right now a cool down. And I know you follow me on Twitter and I've had many disagreements with people because I'm calling this a normal shift and a pause when things change or like interest rates were, are increased. What do you see happening out there? And, uh, you know, do you agree that this is a, 
normal shift in the market for a spring, or are you calling this a cool down as well? Yeah, I, I like to stay in touch with you know leading realtors and brokers like yourself, Asif, in, in various parts of the province, um, the GTA or the North, you know, Ottawa down in Niagara, Windsor, and um, they're seeing a, what I would I would call a tempering of the market. I, I uh, you know I think the language you used is is probably appropriate. Like, still prices are heading uh, in a positive direction, just not at the pace uh, that we saw. And I think there is uncertainty out there around uh, interest rates, uh, the cost of of living. Uh, whether that's you know what's happening uh, overseas and the impact on on our economy, and we did see a rapid escalation of prices over the last couple of years. So I think you know buyers uh, and sellers may be pausing uh, their plans. But your I think your language is probably good as closer to normalcy as opposed to the sort of uh, frothing market that we've seen across Ontario the last uh, year or two. I agree, and that uh, is going to bring us to. The election that's coming up for the province of Ontario, Tim, what do you see coming out uh, uh, just before the election and and even the budget that's going to be coming out in a a little bit? Yeah, you bet. And and on that last point, it it just reinforces the importance of working with a a realtor, your real estate professional, right? Because the market can change uh, very rapidly. And, you know, each kind of home in different parts of the province will have uh, dynamics at work. So that just reinforces that you can't just read the headlines and go buy a house. You know, make sure you've got that informed professional that knows the neighborhood and where things are going at that very moment. Um, so I think we're going to see uh, a lot of focus in this provincial election uh, when it comes to um, real estate uh, and how to make sure home ownership uh, stays uh, within reach for, you know, people who have done everything right, right? They, they played by the rules. They saved every buck that they can. They have good jobs. They want to get in the market, and they can't find a home they can afford. We've certainly had interactions with um, not only the uh, progressive conservatives who are the government, the liberals and Democrats in green. And I anticipate as of you will see ideas in all of their platforms to help keep that Canadian dream of home ownership alive. We've given them good ideas. And by the reaction we had, I think you'll see that spelled out in their platforms. I, I do feel, I do feel that there's some light at the end of the tunnel. We did see the largest increase in new homes built in 2021 that we've seen in two decades. And I just am hearing some positive things from the political parties of all stripes that want to make sure that somebody else can find a, a place to call home finally. And, and housing was definitely the forefront of the federal bu- budget as well. What were your thoughts on what was in the federal budget in regards to housing? Yeah, that's a great point. And that's rare, right? Like usually housing is not a national issue and it's usually not as high in the, in the provincial radar. So if it was a top five federally, you know, I think it's going to be a top three um, provincially. So uh, the federal initiatives, there's there's the, the good and the bad and the ugly, I guess, right? And there's some good stuff in there. There's a new home buyer savers program that's not going to help us overnight, but it will be like your RRSP where you can put money away tax-free and save up for that uh, down payment on your first home down the road. That's a very good long-term step of the Trudeau uh, government. They also set aside $4 billion asset for a uh, housing accelerator fund to work with municipalities that want to actually welcome new neighbors and make sure the next generation can live in great communities. So I like that notion as well. But they also went, you know, quite a distance to, um, you know, intervening in the market by saying that they want to uh, to ban the traditional offer process, the multiple offer process. We talked about that extensively uh, already. I think Ontario is taking a more sensible approach by giving consumers a choice as opposed to a one-size-fits-all solution. Tim, as always, thanks for joining On the Market and for your insight. Uh, if people want to learn more about the open bidding process, is it available on Oria's sites? Yeah, absolutely. We, we put out some information on that a couple of days ago. It remains on our website at orea.com, so O-R-E-A.com. And we'll have more to come as we close the election campaign. We, we wake up every day, ask it just like you do, thinking about how can we help create that next generation of Canadian homeowners so stay tuned at Aria.com. You'll see our plan. Awesome. Thanks, Tim. Enjoy the rest of the weekend. Have a great weekend yourself. After the break, real estate by the numbers, average price, and the home sold count. This is On the Market on 105.9 The Region. Stay with us. Need to connect with Asif Khan from REMAX Prime Properties? Call him, 416-985-Khan. That's 416-985-5426. Or email asif at thehomeshop.ca. Now, back to On the Market on 105.9 The Region. 
Welcome back to On the Market, York Region's exclusive radio real estate show on 105.9 The Region. I'm Tina Cortez, and of course, our real estate expert is Asif Khan from REMAX Prime Properties. Asif, let's talk numbers. Red hot market or a cool down? What do you think? Well, Tina, it is it is a bit of a cool down from the sizzling hot market that we were becoming used to over the last couple of years. So what we're starting to see is we're starting to see a little bit of a pause. And there's been so many things that have been affecting the market from outside. And, you know, it's the, the inflation rate, it's the interest rate going up. But what we have started to see right now is a bit of a spike in inventory levels and that's what we needed we needed more inventory we've been we've been asking for more inventory and now we have it and it's a typical sign of a spring market when inventory starts to spike and it's usually around this time so you said more inventory what does that mean for prices what it means is now buyers have more of a choice so you're not going to get the 30, 40, 50 offers on each property, you're probably still going to get, you know, one, two, four, five offers on a property, but it's not going to drive the prices up like we were used to over the last year and a half where the appreciation was about 30 to 40% in some areas. And that was not healthy. A healthy type of appreciation is 8%, 10%, maybe you want to keep it in single digits. And that's what we were used to in the you know, around 2010, 2012, uh, we were starting to see appreciation hit the 8 to 10% mark. And, and, and we knew that if inventory dropped, that it would be significant in causing unaffordability, if you want to say. And what's your theory about why there is the greater inventory right now? It's a typical market right now. So we're, you know, if you go back to 2000 and 17, 2018, this is where we were at. Uh, you know, you, we still don't have enough inventory to even get to the levels that we were at in 2017, 2018. We were at about four months of inventory. Right now, we're sitting at just over two months of inventory in some areas, and, and some areas are still struggling with one month of inventory. So although we have a lot more inventory than that, what we were used to in December, January, February, it's still not enough to calm the market enough to call it a cool down. So did March see a slowdown compared to February? And what's your take then going forward into later spring and into summer? So compared to February, yes, March was a little bit quieter, but, uh, you know, people were out traveling. They were taking advantage of the March break holiday for the schools. And typically it is quieter in March than it usually is in February in terms of average price and, and also activity sometimes. It starts to pick up after March break, and we're starting to see that now. There's a lot more uh, buyers out there in the market, uh, there there is more selection for them, so they're feeling good about their chances of, of getting into homes. And, and now we're starting to hear stories of people getting homes under asking. Now, there's a big difference in, in getting homes under asking now, whereas getting homes under asking a couple of months ago. A couple of months ago, people were pricing lower, trying to entice the multiple offers by having more traffic into the homes. Now you have to be priced at market value. So even though you're pricing it a little bit higher than where prices were at before, you're still, you're still pretty much getting market value. What we're seeing a drop in, Tina, and what, what uh, the reports are saying with the uh, 3 to 5% price drop is we're starting to see a lot of the smaller homes and condos start to move now. As people make their way back into city core, for jobs, you know, a lot of the jobs are back in person now. People aren't working virtually. They had moved up north into cottages or they had bought larger homes up uh, in north parts of the York region or Simcoe. Now those people are starting to come back to the city and, and get back into the condo market or get back into a smaller home where they can stay in the city and then go up for weekends. So that's what's causing the average price to decline because we're selling a lot more of the lower end items than we were uh, the high end items. So the aggregate average comes down. So how do you console that potential seller right now who thinks, gee, I may have missed the boat? They haven't. You know, right now, with the inventory levels we still have, it's still 
a, a clearly a seller's market. And as long as they're priced properly, they're not going to miss the boat. The sellers that are missing the boat right now are the ones that are trying to price, you know, to January or February's pricing strategies. And then they are relisting because they didn't get enough offers to hit their target price point. You have to go and list that market value right now. So it's a totally different strategy than what a lot of agents are used to because there's a lot of people that got into the real estate industry over the last couple of years. Uh, You know, they're sitting at home doing their courses. So if you aren't familiar with a normal market, it's really tough to navigate through this market. You need to rely on the experience and the expertise of someone that's been around for a while and has seen the changing markets. And how does it reflect on the property for sale when there is a price adjustment? Right now, it, it seems to be the norm. So, you know, we're almost waiting for for a week to go by and, and properties to list at the proper price point because when we're looking at some of these listings coming out and they're three or $400,000 under where they should be, sure, that would have worked last year, but it's not going to work right now. But what you're seeing is the ones that are priced at market value, they're getting, even if it's just one offer, they're getting a good solid offer. And, you know, some the, this is also the return of conditions. So you can get a home inspection in now. You can get a financing condition in now. And you can buy with peace of mind. There's that, that frenzy of activity that was, uh, you know, last year or even up to February. That's kind of calmed down. And that's a good thing for buyers. Yeah, it sounds like you're saying that this is a better time for buyers, that there is a greater opportunity for them to actually get in the market. It certainly is. And, and this is typical. So this time of the year is very typical for buyers to have a greater selection, to be able to pick and choose what they want in a home, and you're not rushed into making that decision in a 15-minute window uh, that we were seeing earlier because there was was a shortage of homes. And now that we're starting to see some homes hit the market, uh, you're starting to get that selection back. So for buyers, it is a a very comfortable time to enter the market. You... Describe this current situation as a bit of a pause. Is it temporary? It is temporary. And anytime you have an increase in interest rates, and you know, we just had two over the last couple of months, we had a quarter point increase and a half point increase for a total of 0.75%. And when people hear that and see that, they want to get their bearings straight. They want to sit down with their bank or their lender and, and go through the numbers, make sure that everything is still okay. And you're going to get that two to four week pause. Uh, you know, the other thing to remember is in March of 2020, we had three consecutive rate decreases of 0.5%. So when you see where we were at at the beginning of March in 2020, pre COVID, and where we're at right now, we're still 0.75% shy of the low rates that we had pre-COVID. So it's still a great time to buy because the rates are still very low. And, you know, we got spoiled over the last couple of years Hmm. by having that 1.5% decrease, uh, stay around for a couple of years. But again, this is typical of a a spring market. The rate does climb. It'll go back down. Uh, It may not go back down as soon as uh, some of the other instances that we've had rate increases with. But typically... Right now, at 0.75% less than what the rates were even heading into COVID, this is still a fabulous time for buyers to get in. When we come back, your real estate questions and the hot listing. This is On the Market on 105.9 The Region, brought to you by Souk, simplifying the home ownership experience. Need to connect with Asif Khan from Remax Prime Properties? Call him, 416-985-Khan. That's 416-985-5426. Or email asif at thehomeshop.ca. Now, back to On the Market on 105.9 The Region. Welcome back to On the Market, York Region's exclusive radio real estate show on 105.9 The Region. Time now for our listener questions. And our first one comes from siblings in Toronto. They have all finally agreed and decided to sell their parents' home. It's likely a teardown, but they're not sure if they should spend the money to stage a home, which is more than 50 years old. Asif, what do you think? You know, that's a great question, and it's one that I was just asked by one of my clients as well. And, you know, we have to evaluate the home. 
And if the home is going to be something that a builder or an investor is going to come in and tear it down and build their own home, then you don't have to spend that money on staging. It's, uh, it's pretty much going to be wasted money. I would rather put that money into, you know, maybe cleaning up the yard, showcasing the yard a little bit better. So we'd have to take a look at the property to, to make sure that, uh, we rule out the staging aspect of it because it may be land value. And if it's land value, someone is looking at this property to tear down or rebuild. And in that case, that's one case where we would say there's no need to stage it. And that's such a great point because there are some areas in Toronto that have these older homes sitting on huge properties, right? Yeah. And and some of these, the, the thing that the builders can't find right now is, the land, the size of the lots. And in the older homes, you know, you had these 100 by 160 foot lots, which was pretty standard. Now that could be a very viable option for a builder to go in and, and put, you know, maybe three or four town homes or two detached homes. So these are double lots that are worth a lot of money. And, and basically it's just that it's, it's the land value. We have another question about staging, and it comes from Lindy in Thornhill. She plans to list her two-bedroom condo, but is wondering how to prep this property for sale. Is decluttering, painting, staging also necessary when selling a condo these days? It sure is, and I would almost say it's even more necessary for a condo because in a building, you usually have six or seven models that are on sale, and, and you might have a couple or three of the same uh, type of unit. So say you're in uh, the 611 unit. So all of the 11 units are going to be pretty much the same. You want your standout. So you do want to paint that. You want it to make lo- make it look good. And you want to showcase the space. Uh, depending on the size of the condo, it could be six to 700 square feet. You want to make sure that when people walk in, it looks a lot bigger than the six to 700 square feet, say. So you want to declutter, you want to use, make use of the locker or a storage space that you can get somewhere and move anything that's bulkier or uh, personal items out into that storage space or into your locker and make sure that people can get around. You want to make sure it's freshly painted, check out the floors and any little updates that you can do like light fixtures, uh, countertops. If you don't have granite or, or quartz countertops, you may want to fix that. But little things that are going to result in big value for you at the end of the day. Lindy says here that it is a two-bedroom condo. I'm not sure how common that size of a condo is these days, so it's probably a good idea as well to really showcase the two bedrooms, right? It really is, and especially if you're using one as an office right now, you don't want it to look like a one-plus den. You really want to have that second bed in there and, and make sure that people know that this is a family size unit and you can have uh, one or two small children in that second bedroom. So you really do want to showcase that as a bedroom. As a reminder, you can send your questions anytime to info at 1059theregion.com. But Asif, if our listeners prefer to contact you directly, how can they do that? You know, they can contact me at 416-985-5426. That's 985-CON. Just before we go, the the on-the-market hot listing brought to you by Souk. That's S-O-U-Q-H, simplifying the home ownership experience. Asif, over to you. You know, we're going to go up to Richmond Hill. And we have, just what we just talked about, we have a teardown, uh, which is basically it's an older bungalow. It's on a double lot. It's 100 by 162 feet deep. This is a fabulous lot for builders. And, and this is something that they can possibly put two homes on. So two 50-foot detached lots could fit on here. Uh, you know, they're going to have to go through the, the zoning process and the severance process. But this is something that uh, a builder or even someone wanting to build a larger custom home or two custom homes, this would be a perfect lot. And it's in Richmond Hill. It's great value. And it's going to be on the market for $1.49 million. Just an absolute steal if you're looking for a lot. And that's what we don't have. We we have a shortage of land. and, And this obviously offers you an opportunity to build your own dream home as well as build another one and sell it and and make some money. Asif, you mentioned the zoning process. How complicated is that in Richmond Hill? 
Bushman Hill is one of the tougher ones for zoning, Tina. And, uh, and by that, I mean, you know, there's a, a, a lot that goes into the process. So you have to apply to a couple of different committees and committees of adjustments. And it takes about six to eight months in, in order to get all these approvals. But the builders do know that. And there's also a tenant on the property and, and the tenant is willing to stay. So you're not going to be, uh, you know, without income while you're going through all the zoning and everything because the tenant is willing to stay as, as long as the purchaser requires them to or wants them to. So you will have income from this property while you're going through the zoning and the severance process. All right, the details one more time about this lot. It's a 100 by 162 foot lot in Richmond Hill. It's uh, at Elgin Mills and Young Street, and it is going to be offered at $1.49 million, and it's coming soon. And this one will get scooped up quickly by the builders. And if our listeners want more information about it? Yeah, they can contact me at 416-985-5426. If you missed any part of our show, go to 1059theregion.com or wherever you get your favorite podcasts, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, and Audible. I'm Tina Cortez. Thank you for listening. Need to connect with Asif Khan from REMAX Prime Properties? Call him, 416-985-Khan. That's 416-985-5426. Or email asif at thehomeshop.ca.